Stranger Things is a beloved sci-fi horror show on Netflix. While it might be hard to believe, elements of the show are based on real government projects. This is three declassified projects that inspired Stranger Things. But just before we get started, we want to tell you about a new podcast that we're really excited about. It's called Dark Tube TV's Wicked History. The podcast is from Brian Hardigan, who wrote this video and has written several other paranormally listed videos. Darktube delves into the scandalous, devious, and sometimes murderous past of our favorite pastime. The first season is a deep dive into the shooting death of actor John Eric Hexum. You can find Darktube at Apple Podcasts and anywhere you find great podcasts. We'll have a link to the podcast in the description box below this video. We highly recommend you check out this awesome podcast. Number 3. Project Stargate In the mid-1970s, the Cold War was at its coldest, and the U.S. Air Force had a division that tried to document and classify Russia's warplanes capabilities. But they had a problem. When Soviet military planes crashed, especially in remote regions, they spent a lot of time and resources trying to locate the crash sites. The U.S. was hoping to retrieve the Russians' technology before they could get it back. The problem came to the attention of Dale Graf, one of the division's intelligence officers. Graf had an interest in ESP, or extrasensory perception. He told his superiors he believed that so-called remote viewing could help the Air Force with its problem. With few other options, the Air Force told him to try it out. Generals then handed Graf a photograph of a 222 blinder Soviet bomber. While intelligence told them it had gone down a few days earlier, they had no idea where. Graf said he would see what he could do. Graf put out word that he was looking for anyone in his office who felt they were sensitive in the ways of ESP. Soon, Rosemary Smith, a secretary in the satellite photography unit, knocked on his door. She believed she had the abilities Graf was looking for. Graf gave Smith the photo of the bomber and asked her if she felt, quote, any impressions, unquote. Rosemary studied the photo for a quarter of an hour and then picked up a pen and paper and started scribbling. To Graf, her drawings seemed like random lines and squiggles. But what struck Graf the most was how Rosemary seemed to be in what he called a light altered state while she drew. After a few minutes, she had a graph a crude but identifiable map. And Rosemary said she felt that the plane had gone down in a remote mountainous area near a lake. While she didn't have a name for the region, she drew an X on her map where she felt that the crash site had been. She also said that she felt that the pilot had bailed out before the crash. Graf wrote up a report of Rosemary's finding and brought it to his superiors, along with her map. A few days later, he and Rosemary were called into a classified briefing, where a map of Zare in the Congo was laid out on a table next to Rosemary's drawing. The two were a match. The Air Force told them that the Russian bomber had been taken by a Libyan who sought to defect to the United States. Now they knew the general area, Africa, but... Then Rosemary walked up to the military's map of the Congo and drew another X. The military sent a search team around it. Eventually, Graf was told that the coordinates of Mary's X were only a few kilometers away from the actual crash site. And the U.S. recovered the Soviet plane along with its technology. If this scenario sounds a little too Area 51 to be real, consider that, in 1995, former President Jimmy Carter confirmed these events. According to the book Phenomena by Andy Jacobson, while speaking to a group of students in Atlanta, Carter admitted that he was impressed with Rosemary Smith's abilities. She gave us some latitude and longitude figures, Carter told the group. We focus our satellite cameras on that point and the plane was there. 
Seeing the potential for remote viewers for intelligence purposes, the CIA launched a number of secret projects to test other sensitives. Eventually, those varying separate projects were combined into one umbrella program called Project Stargate. In the scope of Stargate's experiments, our remote viewers were expanded. Instead of focusing only on ESP, researchers also tried to discover if a sensitive could actually create outcomes with their minds. As with psychokinesis, the ability to inhabit someone's personality and emotions, or telekinesis, being able to move objects with just a thought, or even pyrokinesis, the ability to start a fire using only one's mind. The 2004 book, The Man Who Stare at Goats, chronicles those Stargate Project tests, which, in real life, failed to get the CIA's desired results. The project was shut down and declassified in 1994. Watching Eleven being ordered to kill a cat with her mind in Season 1's third episode, it's hard not to see the inspiration of an office secretary and an X on a map. Number 2. Project Montauk With the fourth season of Stranger Things appearing to be about some form of time travel, it's easy to see where the producers plucked their inspiration. But they didn't look to Back to the Future for their time travel story. Instead, they looked to Long Island, New York. According to a man named Preston Nichols, it was there at Montauk Military Base where the U.S. government first started playing with time during the 1980s. As a former employee of the base, known locally as Camp Hero, Nichols spilled the beans on the secret program in his 1992 book, The Montauk Project, Experiments in Time. In it, he claimed scientists of the base first attempted to create technology to make warships invisible, not only to radar, but the naked eye. Unfortunately, those experiments inadvertently set the USS Eldridge a destroyer escort back in time to 1943, however briefly. When the ship returned to 1983, many of its crew were dead or had gone mad. The US Navy, of course, denied this story. However, an investigation by Newsday in 1992 revealed that there had been a number of odd electrical storms across Long Island on the days the experiments supposedly occurred. Surprisingly, these storms were not mentioned in Nichols' book, though they occurred on the same day as the supposed time travel experiment. Conveniently, in 1997, the U.S. Navy announced that most of its official records from the 1980s had been accidentally destroyed by the National Archives. According to the Associated Press, over 4,000 scientific notebooks and 600 boxes of memos and technical specs were inadvertently sent to the shredder and recycled. But the Philadelphia experiment, as it was called, wasn't the only weird thing going on in Camp Hero. You might say there were stranger things, like the Montauk chair. In his book, Nichols recalls a purpose-built chair that was connected to all kinds of electrodes and coils, some of which were based on the designs of Nikola Tesla. The theory behind the chair was that it would amplify a sensitive's abilities, thereby allowing the subject to communicate thoughts across time and space, perhaps even dimensions. When an experiment, also in 1983, turned the transmitter on the chair past its breaking point. The result, Nichols wrote, was that the subject strapped to the chair accidentally released a monster, either from his unconscious or from another dimension. Described as being 9 or 10 feet tall and hairy like a Sasquatch, this creature supposedly rampaged through the halls of Camp Hero. Though military personnel tried to capture the monster, it eventually escaped, and is said to roam around Long Island and the now abandoned military base to this day. A beast hopping into our dimension from another. That sounds a lot like Stranger Things Demogorgons. Perhaps it's no wonder the Duffer Brothers originally wanted to call their show 
Montauk. Number one, Project Artichoke. In the late 1950s, political writer Richard Condon was searching for an idea for his next novel. Using his Rolodex of contacts, he soon sat down for interviews with former military men and those in the intelligence community. It wasn't long before his ears perked up upon hearing about a low-key government initiative called Project Artichoke. The gist of that project was that the CIA had been experimenting with hypnosis, trying to alter the behavior of a few unwilling test subjects. Apparently, the company had based its project on similar projects being undertaken by the Russians. That's all Condon needed to hear. He set about writing the 1959 novel, The Manchurian Candidate, about a man who was hypnotized into trying to assassinate a U.S. president. The story was adapted into a 1962 feature film starring Lawrence Harvey as the unknowing Patsy programmed to kill. At first glance, it seemed like a gripping, if fantastical, political thriller. But when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated a year later, more than one conspiracy theorist raised an eyebrow. Project Artichoke and other shadowy experiments like it were soon shut down. But the research was melded into a new CIA initiative called MKUltra. This new umbrella project incorporated not only hypnosis as a means of control, but added drugs to its arsenal as well, particularly LSD. CIA scientists would dose unwitting people with psychotropic drugs this even made their thoughts more malleable. In one case, a U.S. citizen accused of stealing top secret documents was tortured with chronic doses of the drug in an effort to force a confession. He was eventually awarded $600,000 by the government for wrongful confinement. In another case, made famous by the Netflix docudrama Wormwood, a CIA agent was accidentally dosed with LSD which caused him to die by suicide by jumping out of a high window. But MKUltra continued through the 1960s. However, the scientists eventually found that LSD was not giving them the truth serum and brainwashing results they desired. So the company opened its medicine cabinet to also test the effects of psilocybin, mescaline, and even heroin, all on subjects who were underinformed or unaware of the tests. There are those who believe that Sirhan B. Sirhan, the assassin of Robert Kennedy in 1968, was an unwitting participant in the program's experiments. One of the men who believed this was Sirhan's own attorney, Lawrence Teeter. When trouble started brewing in the White House in 1973, thanks to Watergate, CIA Director Richard Helms shut down MKUltra worried that many of the government's secret programs would be exposed by the Watergate investigation, he ordered all MKUltra's documents destroyed. Whatever papers we have today are only thanks to misfiling at the National Archives. In Stranger Things Season 1, Episode 3, Hopper discovers that Dr. Brenner may have been involved in the MKUltra program, and he mentions the program by name. And that's because MKUltra isn't just some shadowy conspiracy cooked up by people in tinfoil hats. The program was real. It was the subject of a 1977 Congressional Subcommittee investigation. Incredibly, or perhaps rightly, the committee was chaired by Edward Kennedy. In the end, MKUltra was deemed a failure by the people who worked on it. In his book, The Search for the Manchurian Candidate, The CIA in Mind Control, author John D. Marks writes, I cannot be positive that they never found a technique to control people, despite my definite bias, that the human spirit defeated the manipulators. Perhaps an apt metaphor for Eleven's character journey through Stranger Things. 
Thank you so much for watching this video. We hope you found it interesting. If you did find it interesting, please make sure you subscribe. We'll have a new video about the paranormal every week. If you just discovered this channel, please make sure you check out our other channel, Criminally Listed. We have over 325 videos featuring bizarre but true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash listed. We also have a podcast about cold cases that were eventually solved called Criminally Listed Presents Into the Killing. You can find it on Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and anywhere you find great podcasts. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.